you have a copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to open to the book of Ezra. We'll be looking at Ezra chapter 4 this morning. Uh, with that said, if you don't have a copy of God's Word, there should be one right in front of you in the pew. Uh, if there's not one directly in front of you, maybe your neighbor could help you to get one out of their pew. And if you don't have a copy of God's Word at home, then we want to invite you to go ahead and just take that Bible. That can be uh, your copy of God's Word to be able to bring with you back and forth uh, to worship each week and also to study uh, throughout the week uh, on your own. So this morning, Ezra chapter 4, we're going to look at the, the whole chapter. And so we're going to make our way through it uh, rather briskly, I, I pray. So last week, if you were with us uh, in the book of Ezra, we saw that the returnees, they had uh, returned from exile and they were worshiping the Lord. That the altar had been rebuilt, but the foundation of the temple had been restored. They had made their relationship with God a priority. They were rightly worshiping God and they were serving Him in obedience to His word. And so what we were witnessing was a restart, right? The first week we talked about how this is a, a new exodus that was led out of the, the Babylon territory under the control of Persia. It's pictured as a, a new exodus, a redemption from slavery and directly back into the land. So this is a, a restart. It's a, a renewal or a revival for the people of God. And so that was a mountaintop experience there in chapter 3. Things were going really well. Of course, there were some who were mourning at the lack of luster of the new temple. Those who were older had uh, seen Solomon's temple and they remembered its glory and they were looking at the foundation of the new temple and they were quickly realizing that it wasn't going to measure up the way that they thought it should. So that caused a bit of mourning. But this was a mountaintop time. They were praising and rejoicing the Lord. They were keeping the Feast of Booths. They were, they were worshiping the Lord rightly in accordance with His Word. And if you've been a Christian for very long at all, and you've done anything for the Kingdom of God, you can almost anticipate what comes next. Everything is going well, and then opposition comes. Opposition begins. And as we'll see in our passage today, in the way that Ezra structures this chapter... Opposition doesn't just start and then quickly stop. Opposition starts immediately, and it won't let up. It continues on, continuing on, week after week, and month after month, and year after year. So the theme of our study this morning is going to be opposition to the work of the kingdom of God. And as we study through this chapter, I want us to see six things about opposition because I believe that one of the keys to overcoming adversity, to remaining faithful, to remaining faithful personally and as a church corporately, is to expect adversity. Just know that it's going to come. And as you do, you'll be better prepared to react to it. So let's read Ezra chapter 4, and then we'll begin to work through it looking at six different headings. It says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the fathers' houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do. And we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Ezrahadon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the fathers' houses in Israel said to them, you have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God. But we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purposes all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. In the days of Artaxerxes, Bishlam and Mithridath and Tabeel and the rest of their associates wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia. The letter was written in Aramaic and translated. Rehum the commander and Shemeshai the scribe wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, the king, as follows. Rehum the commander, Shimshai the scribe, and the rest of their associates, the judges, the governors, the officials, the Persians, the, men's, the men of Erech, 
the Babylonians, the men of Susa, that is the Elamites, and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Osnapper deported and settled in the cities of Samaria and in the rest of the province beyond the river. This is a copy of the letter that they sent. To Artaxerxes the king, your servants, the men of the province beyond the river, send greeting. And now be it known to the king that the Jews who came up from you to us have gone to Jerusalem. They are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are finishing the walls and repairing the foundations. Now be it known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and the walls finished, they will not pay tribute, custom, or toll, and a royal revenue will be impaired. Now because we eat the salt of the palace, and it is not fitting for us to witness the king's dishonor, therefore we send and inform the king, in order that the search may be made in the book of the records of your fathers, you will find in the book of the records and learn that this city is a rebellious city, hurtful to kings and provinces, and that sedition was stirred up in it from of old. That was why this city was laid waste. We make known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls finished, you will then have no possession in the province beyond the river. The king sent an answer to Rahim the commander and Shimshai the scribe and the rest of the associates who live in Samaria and in the rest of the province beyond the river, greeting. And now the letter that you sent to us has been plainly read before me, and I made a decree, and search has been made, and it has been found that this city from of old has risen against kings, and that rebellion and sedition have been made in it. And mighty kings have been over Jerusalem, who ruled the whole province beyond the river, to whom tribute, custom, and toll were paid. Therefore make a decree that these men be made to cease, and that this city may not be rebuilt until a decree is made by me. And take care not to be slack in this matter. Why should damage grow to the hurt of the king? Then when the, when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rahim and Shimshai, the scribe, and their associates, they went in haste to the Jews of Jerusalem and by force and power made them cease. Then the work on the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped. And it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. All right, let's pray this morning and ask God's blessing and his assistance on his word as we study. <clears throat> our Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you this morning with our Bibles open to the book of Ezra, the fourth chapter. And Father, we pray that just as we have laid our Bibles open, that you would open our hearts and our minds so that we may behold wondrous things from your word. Lord, we believe that in your word contains the very truth that you have recorded through the working of your spirit as men of old were carried along and recorded the very words and syllables that you desired in the original autographs. And so, Father, as your word is inspired and authoritative, Lord, we know that it is sufficient. Lord, it is sufficient to equip the man of God for every good and noble purpose. So, Father, we pray that through the study of your word, that you would shape us and mold us. That you would help us to remain faithful. That you would teach us and guide us. And Lord, we pray for all of these things, recognizing that only you can do them. So Father, we pray for them from you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the first truth that we need to see, the first heading, is simply that opposition will come to the work of God. Opposition will come to the work of God. And that's the first truth. And I put it here because you likely already know that. If you have attempted to do anything with your personal life as far as pursuing holiness or pursuing the things of God or doing any sort of work for the kingdom of God in your own personal life, you know how quickly the attacks from the evil one will come against you. But isn't it true, even in the corporate life of the church, that when we seek to do something for the kingdom of God, there will always be opposition. That opposition may look like infighting within the church. Or those who would seek to undermine the things that are happening. It may come from the outside. It may be sporadic or it may be constant. But it is always going to be true. That the more that a church attempts and seeks to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Both in fulfilling the great commandment and the great commission. There will always be assaults from the kingdom of darkness. Always. And I know to our western ears, it seems strange for us to talk about things like 
attacks from a, a real being, Satan or Lucifer, to think about these attacks coming from a, a very real kingdom of darkness. In fact, you may be thinking to yourself, these sound like, like mythologies or, or fables, but don't be fooled by the way that your thinking has been imposed upon by the, the constraints of Western civilization. There is a very real devil who very much hates God. And by extension, he hates the people of God. And since he hates God and the people of God, he will do everything within his power to stop and hinder the work of the mission of God. And so if you don't start with that as your presupposition, you are already starting and setting yourself out for failure. Ezra chapter 4 is a strange chapter. It's not strange because it, it records the workings of very real humans. So we have these ones that are opposed, right? You have this character Zerubbabel and Joshua, and you learn about Artaxerxes and Ahasuerus or Xerxes. You learn about Cyrus and Darius and Shimshai and these other ones that are opposed to the kingdom of God. That's not what I mean by strange. What is strange about this is the structure of the chapter. And in order to fully grasp what Ezra is trying to do, you have to understand the way that he has put this chapter together. You see, what we're going to look at in verses 1 through 6 is this group that he's going to call the adversaries. And we're going to look at them here in just a moment. But what we need to understand is that Ezra has structured this chapter not so much in chronological fashion. Now, it does happen with a certain chronology. It follows one king right after the other. But then toward the end, he's going to revert back again. But his purpose is not to tell you the chronology. His purpose is to show you a theme, to show you something theologically. His point is to show you that once the opposition started, it didn't stop. In fact, this chapter covers about a hundred years of history. So you have various kings that come along and so say, Cyrus, the man who decreed to send them back in God's sovereign providence. Then you go all the way to Artaxerxes. Then you go back to, to Darius. And so this chapter is covering a hundred or so years of different rulers. And the chapter largely follows in this order. Cyrus and Darius, right? You meet up with them whenever you get to verse 4. And this is 4 and 5. And this is taking place during the time of Cyrus reigned 559 to 486 B.C. And then we are 4, 559 to later in close to 400 B.C. or four, uh, 500 B.C. rather. And then Darius picked up and reigned all the way to 486 B.C. Then we are encountering this man named Ahasuerus in verse 6. This is Xerxes. He reigned from 486 to 465 B.C. This, by the way, is the time of Esther. This is the king that's talked about in the book of Esther. Then you have Artaxerxes in verse 7. Well, Artaxerxes reigned from 465 to 423 B.C. And that takes you all the way through to verse 23. That's the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. In fact, we'll see in just a moment, this is the one that Nehemiah is a cupbearer to. But then in verse 24, he shifts all the way back. He says, Then the work on the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So he jumps backwards, about 80 years back from Artaxerxes, back to Darius. So if you wanted a broad way to think about this chapter, what you would see is, is that verses 1 through 5 are meant to be taken as this group. 6 all the way through 23 is a parenthesis, or a, an explanation of the ongoing work of people like this group. It is showing the example of the opposition that this group set up. So it's a parenthesis. But then in verse 24, he goes all the way back to where verse 5 left off. Now the way that, that Ezra has worded this chapter, it seems as though that verse 23 should... Or verse 24 should follow directly after 23. It says, Then when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rahim and Shimshai, the scribe and their associates, they went in haste to the Jews at Jerusalem and by force made them cease. 
Then the work on the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped. It ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So if you didn't know your history, what you would think is 23 naturally leads to 24. But what's actually happening is 23 is the end of that parenthesis. If you wanted to think about it in, in these uh, parentheses, right? 24 goes all the way back to verse 5. Now Ezra, being a, a master wordsmith, has structured the chapter so that it flows. But his point is not chronological. His point is theological. So why would Ezra go to the, uh, to the problem or go to the trouble to structure a chapter this way? For two reasons. The first is Ezra is going to great lengths to show that opposition came to them and it didn't stop. It didn't stop during the time of Darius. It didn't stop during the time of Xerxes. It didn't stop during the time of Artaxerxes. So he's structuring this, showing that all the way through, when Ezra is going to go back in chapter 7, the people of God have been under opposition the whole time. It's not been easy. The second reason that he's doing this is to illustrate that those in 1 through 5, as we'll see in a moment, by the way that they acted, they revealed their true nature. So why do we need to concern ourselves with this? Why do we need to study this? It's because it has always been true that whenever God is moving, the forces of darkness are going to try to stop it. It happened during the time of Cyrus. It happened during the time of Darius. It happened in the time of Xerxes. And it happened in the time of Artaxerxes. The people of God were trying to remain faithful to the mission. Now they had periods of, of being faithful, periods of not being faithful. And we'll see some of those ups and downs in the chapters to come. But the whole time that they're working to fulfill the mission of the kingdom of God in that day, they are under opposition. The second reason why it's important is because if we're going to do anything for the kingdom of God in our personal lives or in the corporate life of this church, we have to expect opposition. It's much easier to stay faithful when you are constantly on guard. They used to tell us in football, right? Keep your head on a swivel. And what did they mean by that? They meant that you could get hit from any direction, so you better be looking all around you all the time to make sure you didn't get blindsided. Far too many Christians, far too many churches, far too many movements have been blindsided. We as the people of God, we have to keep our head on a swivel. Now, it doesn't mean that we are constantly looking for problems. Of course, we're not trying to start trouble. But we always need to expect that tomorrow... Opposition could start. Today, opposition could begin. Now let's look at how the opposition came to them, and perhaps we can start to think about some ways that it may come to us. The first thing is, is that opposition will come by subterfuge, or by trying to infiltrate, or using deceptive means to try to come in and to overthrow or undo the things that are happening. Now you may not see that directly, but I do want us to stay, I think, after you see through it, you'll understand what I mean by this. Notice how Ezra begins this chapter. Now, when the adversaries, do you see that? Enemies. Now, they're going to say, we worship God just like you do. But Ezra immediately calls them enemies or adversaries. When they heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel... They approached, they went to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses, they went to the elders and they said to them, let us build with you, for we worship your God just as you do, and we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Ezarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But notice Zerubbabel and Jeshua's response. But Zerubbabel, he's the governor, Jeshua, he's the high priest, and the rest of the father's houses in Israel said to them, you have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God. Do you see that? They said, we worship your God as you do. He says, you have nothing to do with our God. 
But we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us to do. Now you may be thinking to yourself, what are they doing? If you've worked in any sort of trade, you know that the more people you can get involved, the better it will be when it's a massive project. So you may be thinking these returnees are a bit unreasonable. You may say, look, they're being a bit ridiculous. If there's work to be done and people are offering to help, why not take it? They said they worship God. Well, the reason is found in an earlier portion of Scripture. Turn over to 2 Kings chapter 17. Second Kings chapter 17, and look at verses 24 through 41. It says, And the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Abba, Hamath, and Sepharbaim, or Beam, and the placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the people of Israel. This is what Assyria is doing. They are bringing in outside groups to repopulate the area of Israel. They took possession of Samaria, lived in its cities. And at the beginning of the, their dwelling there, they did not fear the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. So the king of Assyria was told, The nations that you have carried away and placed in the cities of Samaria do not know the law of the God of the land. Therefore he sent lions among them, and behold, they are killing them, because they do not know the law of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, Send there one of their priests, whom you carried away from there, and let him go and dwell there, and teach them the law of the God of the land. So one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and lived in Bethel, and taught them how they should fear the Lord. But every nation still made gods of its own, put them in the shrines of the high places that the Samaritans had made. Every nation in the cities in which they lived, the men of Babylon made Sukkoth, Benoth, and the men of Kuth made Nergal, and the men of Hamath made Ashima, and the Abites made Nabahaz and Tartok, and the Sephirbites burned their children in the fire to Adramelech and Anamelech and the gods of Sepharvim. They also feared the Lord and appointed from among themselves all sorts of people as priests of the high places who sacrificed for them in the shrines of the places. So they feared the Lord, but they also served their own gods after the manner of the nations from among whom they had been carried away. To this day, they do according to the former manner. They do not fear the Lord. They do not follow the statutes or the rules or the law of the commandments that the Lord God commanded the children of Jacob. Whom he named Israel, the Lord made a covenant with them, commanded them, You shall not fear other gods, or bow yourself to them, or serve them, or sacrifice to them. But you shall fear the Lord, who brought you out of the land of Egypt with great power, with outstretched arm. You shall bow yourselves to him, and to him you shall sacrifice. The statutes, rules, and law, and commandments that he wrote for you, you shall always be careful to do. You shall not fear other gods. You shall not forget the covenant that he made with you. You shall not fear other gods. But you shall fear the Lord your God, and he will deliver him out of the hand of your enemies. However, they would not listen, but they did according to their former manner. So these nations feared the Lord and also served the carved images. Their children did likewise, likewise, and their children's children as their fathers did, so they do to this day. So did they worship God like the Israelites? Kind of. But they also worshipped foreign gods. They were syncretists. They wanted a little bit of Yahweh and a little bit of other gods. They wanted to worship rightly, but they also wanted to kill their children with the fire. So they were these people that were not true worshippers of God. So Ezra rightly identifies them as adversaries. Their motives are not pure. Zerubbabel, Jeshua, the elders, they know that. Think about it. They had cultural, political power and influence in the area. If the returnees are able to continue, they will lose every bit of the influence they have. You'll see this list here in just a moment. It includes many, many powerful people. But if they are able to help, if they can join up with the work, well, then they can get in on their own terms 
And maybe, just maybe, they can influence it to be in their favor. Maybe they could even find a way to rule over those who have a turn. They're greater in number. They already have influence and political power in the region. So if they can just take over what the people of God are doing, well, then they can manipulate what God's doing for their own benefit. And be sure there are pathways that they could have taken in order to become members of the covenant community. But it wouldn't have been on their own terms. They wouldn't have been distinct. They would have had to work for those who were in charge. They would have had to become actually part of the people of God. And we see immediately in verses 4 through 6, which continues all the way being expanded to verse 23, their true nature. Look at verse 4. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build, bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purposes all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. No true worshiper of God would have tried to stop the rebuilding of the temple. No one. Even if they couldn't help they wouldn't have tried to stop it. David was not allowed to build the temple. So he got things together so Solomon could build it. And here's the truth. Opposition will come by those who don't belong to the church. And when I say church, I need you to know I'm talking about the church global. The church is in the people of God. Opposition will come by those who don't belong to the church, who are lost people trying to infiltrate the church so as to influence the church. Make no mistake about it. Satan will always try to put his men behind the pulpits. Satan will always try to put his men in places of power and influence so that he can infiltrate in order to influence the church. Sometimes it's very subtle. Sometimes it's pretty obvious. But I'll say this. Even if a person is wealthy, influential, talented, or morally upstanding, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ must reject their advances because the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness cannot be joined together. Cannot be. Now, just as with them, if these people become believers, truly saved, surely they are called, commanded to join in with the efforts. But we never allow lost people to dictate what we do. Never. You never, ever, ever allow lost people to influence the worship of God. You never allow the lost world to dictate what the church can and cannot do. Our marching orders come directly from the Lord of glory himself, not from lost people. So when they try to influence, when they try to infiltrate, no matter how much talent or funds, resources you think they would bring to the table, the people of God have to say no. Now, this is not going to make their life easier. In fact, this is going to make their life infinitely more difficult. But they understood, as we should, that the kingdom of God has nothing to do with the kingdom of darkness. And I do want to say a word to you if you're not a Christian. And I say this with as utmost respect and love for you as I can muster. You do not belong. I say this with no malice, with no bad intention, but I want to be crystal clear here. We as the church, we hope you feel welcome. We hope that you will continue to come and sit under the Word of God. But until you come to faith in Christ, you're just not one of us. The worst thing that I could do this morning is to stand up here and tell a non-believer that they belong. That would be the most unloving thing I could do. To coax you into feeling like you're okay with God until you die, only to be sentenced to hell for eternity. 
So if you are a non-Christian, I want you to listen to this. God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He told them that if they ate the fruit of the tree, they would surely die. They ate from the tree. Spoiler alert. And when they ate, they died spiritually immediately and they began to die physically. They were separated from an infinitely holy God. And every human being that has been born since Eden has been born separated from God and born with a sin nature. And that sin nature manifests itself in the sinful practices that we commit. So we are sinners by nature and practice who are separated from an eternally holy God and stand under His righteous judgment. And we, as sinful people, are powerless to do anything about it. But God in His grace sent His Son, who willingly came, who was born of a virgin, who lived a sinless life, the life we could never live. And then He died on the cross in our place. He died the death that we all deserved. He was buried in a tomb, but by the power of God, He was raised on the third day. He appeared to many witnesses. Then He ascended to be back with the Father. And the Bible says that any sinner anywhere who will turn away from their sin and their self and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith, asking Him to save you based on what He did on the cross, committing your life to Him as your Lord, the Bible says that He will save you. He will give you the righteousness of Christ. You will be declared righteous, justified, and you will be adopted into the people of God. You will then truly belong. Amen. But here's the truth of it. No matter how moral you are, no matter how much you may think you look like Christians, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't belong. But you can today. These people, rather than come into the covenant community through the prescribed ways that God had given in His Word, they decided instead to become enemies and to try to stop the kingdom of God. So church, opposition will come by subterfuge. It's a neat word, isn't it? I had to look it up. All right. <laughs> Third point, opposition will come by the lost majority. And we're going to move through the rest of this rather quickly. But notice in verses 7 through 10, I just want you to notice the list of names. Notice the people groups and how they are just piling one on top of the other. In the days of Artaxerxes, Bishlam and Mithridath and Tabeel and the rest of their associates wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia. The letter was written in Aramaic and translated, literally translated into Aramaic. Rahum, the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against <coughs> Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, the king, as follows. Notice this list. Rahum, the commander, Shimshai, the scribe, the rest of their associates, the judges, the governors, the officials, the Persians, the men of Erech, the Babylonians, the men of Susa, that is the Elamites and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Osnapper deported and settled in the cities of Samaria and in the rest of the province beyond the river. To Artaxerxes the king. Do you see? All of these people are on our side. We are writing to you, Artaxerxes, and all of these influential people, all of these folks, they agree with us that the people of God should stop building the city. This whole majority, these influential people, Ray of the Commander, Shimshai, judges, governors, officials, Persians, all of these, all of these folks, they agree with us. They don't agree with the Jews. They agree with us. They are the majority. I mean, the majority, rather. The people of God are the minority. Church, don't be surprised if the majority comes after the work of the kingdom of God. You can't get more influential than this. They've got L.A. and Washington, D.C. on their side. They've got them piled up. All of them. Nothing else in common except for they all agree that 
the people of God need to stop doing what they're doing. You may look at this, you may wonder why so many people are getting up against them. Who cares? Who cares? Have you ever seen a, a, a picture of the Persian Empire at this time? Especially during the times of Darius. Have you seen a picture of the Persian Empire? Probably not. It's massive. Massive. That's your homework. Go home and on the Google web, look up Persian Empire, time of Darius. Have you ever seen the size of Israel? I one time had a picture of Israel, and it was uh, superimposed upon a picture of Texas. It is tiny compared to Texas. Most things are tiny compared to Texas. I mean, you got to grant that, right? If Alaska melted, it would also be tiny compared to Texas. Texas is obviously the best and greatest and largest state in the, in the entire day. But anyway, moving on past that. Why would they care? Who cares? That would be like somebody writing to Governor Abbott and saying, Hey, did y'all see that Fred is actually building a wall around their baseball field? <laughs> if you don't stop them, all of Texas is going to fall apart. Abbott would say, Where's Fred? <laughs> If it was Spurger, that'd be a different story. Now, we're important. <laughs> but do you understand what's going on here? I mean, who cares about this? If you're, if you're Artaxerxes, you've got bigger things to worry about than this. Never forget that the church is locked into a war that is happening between the kingdom of God and kingdom of darkness. You see, what may have been happening in this tiny little map dot of a place compared to the Persian Empire is nothing less than the kingdom of light versus the kingdom of darkness. Satan hates God, hates his people, hates the mission. So he rounded up, roused up all of these influential people to come against the people of God. Nothing else in common except that. Even in our own day, we are seeing groups who have nothing else in common joining up with one another in opposition to the church. The church. Influential people are leveraging everything they can muster to stop the church. They don't want it. The good news is the darker the room, the brighter the smallest flame can shine. We continue to be faithful and we combat this with the gospel. Standing firmly in our convictions and relentlessly sharing the gospel with our lost neighbors. You fight against the darkness by pointing them to the only one who can turn them into the children of light. <clears throat> Praise be to God that the majority who is lost doesn't have to stay the majority who is lost. Share the gospel with them. But never be shocked when you look around and you say, They don't have anything in common except they hate us. That's strange. It's not all that strange. <coughs> it's been going on since the garden. The fourth truth. Opposition will come by half-truths and misrepresentation. Opposition will come by half-truths and misrepresentation. There are half-truths here. We have to acknowledge there are half-truths. As we walk through this passage beginning in verse 11. To Artaxerxes, the king, your servants, the men of the province beyond the river. By the way, beyond the river just means beyond the river, you phrase, on the other side. Send greeting. And now be it known to the king that the Jews who came up from you to us have gone to Jerusalem. They are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They really are rebuilding. It's not necessarily rebellious and wicked. They are finishing the walls and repairing the foundation. That's another half-truth. They are not finishing the walls. Nehemiah's got to come and finish the now be it known to you, the king, that if this city is rebuilt and the walls finished, they will not pay tribute, custom, or toll, and the royal revenue will be impaired. Have you seen any hint of that at all? They came back under a decree from Cyrus. As we'll see, Darius is the one that helps them along, and Artaxerxes is the one who will send Nehemiah back with what he needs to be able to rebuild the walls with the authority that he needs. That's a half-truth. They are rebuilding, but they have no intention not to pay these things. And of course, they say, now as we eat the salt of the palace, which is literally where our English word salary comes from, the Latin word, which is this phrase here, it is not fitting for us to witness the king's dishonor. Therefore, we 
hasten to inform the king in order the search may be found. Right? Go search it out. He says here, you will learn that the city is a rebellious city, hurtful to kings and providences, that, that sedition was stirred up in it from old. That was why the city was laid waste. Partially so, Jeconiah, Zedekiah, those who came before them, even Hezekiah to a certain extent, they, they did indeed defend themselves. But the reason why they were laid waste was because they were disobedient to God. He says, we make known to the king that if the city is rebuilt and its walls finished, you will have no possession beyond the river. Can you imagine that? Again, going back to our illustration writing to the president and saying, hey, if Fred finishes that wall around the ballpark, you're not going to have any sort of influence over them at all. Half-truths, misrepresentations. These returning exiles have no intention of waging war against the Persians. The Persians. No intention. And I'll say this, don't be surprised if the enemies of the church present half-truths and misrepresent what we believe in the Bible teaches. Just think about some hot-button topics today in our culture. If you listen to the opponents of the church, what will they say? They hate homosexuals. The church hates homosexuals. They don't want women to have a choice of what they do with their bodies. They suppress women in every way. They don't allow them to serve and do anything. They don't care about people, especially young people who struggle with gender dysphoria. These are the way that the church is presented in the mainstream culture. If you ask a non-believer, this is what you're going to get. Are those things true? They're half-truths. Do you know that none of them are fully true in total? None of those statements are true in the fullest extent. Now, do we, as the people of God, believe that homosexuality is an abomination of God's creation or marriage? Of course we do. But we also love those who struggle with this sin as image bearers of God. And we believe that Christ can set them free from bondage to that sin, just like He set us free from bondage to the sins that so easily ensnare us. Now, to be sure, their identity is now wrapped up in their lifestyle choices, so it makes it a bit of a conundrum in how Christians can articulate that. But we don't hate homosexuals. We hate homosexuality. We love them just like we love everybody else, and we share the gospel with them. And I don't mean to be cliche, hate the sinner, hate, I mean, love the sinner, hate the sin. That's not what I mean by that. Those two things generally go together. But what I'm saying is, as image bearers of God, we don't hate anybody. In fact, we're not even allowed, as the people of God, to hate our enemies. We have to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. It's again a half-truth. What about we don't believe that women should have a right to do with their own bodies what they want to do? Every Christian everywhere believes that a woman should have the same right as men to choose health care options that fit them best. Their care for their specific needs should be cared for in the most productive ways. I, as a pastor, would never tell a woman, hey, you can't go see this doctor, or you have to go to this hospital, or you can't choose that insurance, or you can't choose that plan of action. But we never believe that a woman can freely murder their unborn child. Of course we don't. And it's because we love the child just like we love the mother. We want what's best for both of them. Do we hate women? Of course not. We just don't want women murdering their children in the womb. It's common sense. Do we suppress women? Not at all. In fact, we believe that in church and in society cannot function without women. Men, I don't know if you knew this, but you kind of needed a woman to get here. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have women in the society you have to have women in the home you have to have women in the church women do things that men cannot even beyond childbirth of course but women do things that, that men cannot do men and women are wired differently married people you know what I'm talking about <laughs> 
We seek to empower women to serve in capacities that highlight their gifts and talents. However, we talents, but we believe that God has designed complementary roles for the sexes into his creation and into his church. Broadly in the creation and into the church more specifically. So we need women to serve in roles that God has assigned them. And it is good. And men can't do it. We don't suppress women. We try to raise them up. Just not to become men. You see? That's the difference. The culture tells young ladies you have to be manlike. You have to do what men can only do. Right? You have to make sure that there is nothing that, that men are doing that... That you can't do. And it bleeds into the church. And by the way, it tells men they need to be like women. But the fact is, God created women to be women. And in a beautiful, complementary way, a way that we see in the Garden of Eden, that they, they complement one another's strengths and they strengthen one another's weaknesses. We need men to be men. We need women to be women. Now let me get off the soapbox. I'm moving on. Okay. <laughs> do we care about people that struggle with gender dysphoria? Of course we do. Of course we do. We care for people with all kinds of mental illness. But we as the people of God, we believe that God makes no mistakes. And that the surgeon cannot undo what God has created special and unique for His glory. And if that's hatred, then, beloved, I don't know what love is. God created every person, male and female, unique, for His glory, special. And we, as the people of God, we refuse to say that a surgeon can undo it. And we should, rightly, refuse to say that. Misrepresentation and half-truths. It's what's going on in our culture today. It's what went on back then. The problem is, King Artaxerxes believed the half-truth. He made them stop. Look, look at verses 17 through 24. The king sent an answer to Rehum, the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of the associates who lived in Samaria and the rest of the province beyond the river, greeting you. And now the letter that you sent to us has been plainly read from before me. I made a decree. Search has been made. It has been found that the city from of old has risen against kings. Rebellion and sedition have been made in it. Mighty kings who have been over Jerusalem, who rule over the whole province beyond the river to whom tribute, custom, and toll were paid. Therefore, make a decree that these people, these men, be made to cease. The city not be revealed until a decree is made by me. That's very important. And take care not to be slack in this matter. Why should damage go to the herd of the king? Then when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read with Florayim and Shimshai, the scribe and their associates, they went in haste to the Jews of Jerusalem and by force and power made them cease. He decreed that they should stop. It is possible that if the work had actually begun, that they destroyed what had already been going on. It's very likely, or very possible, I should say. I shouldn't say likely, but it's very possible that Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, really 1, 1 through 3, which says this, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, now it happened in the month of Kislev on the 20th, 20th year, as I was in Susa the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. Nehemiah may simply be referencing or hearing about the original destruction, but it's also possible that they had started to build. They had started to put pieces together. And then when they received this copy of Artaxerxes' letter, Rehum and Shimshai and the associates went and destroyed everything. And that's a possibility. Now I want to be careful here. Because in the country that we live in, we experience tremendous freedom to worship and evangelize without fear of persecution or physical harm. But many in the world are not in that position. There are many cultures, many Christians around the world who are experiencing opposition in a forceful manner. Not just opposition in the sense of coming against you verbally, but physically. With power and force, he says, made them cease. Many Christians experience that. Prayerfully, we will continue to have freedoms that we now enjoy, but we should never take them for granted. You know, looking back, 
during the COVID pandemic, we should rightly, rightly be very wary of the government stepping in and telling the church when and where they can worship. Amen. If you think they don't want power over the church, you're crazy. In Canada, James Coates, many others were arrested because they refused to stop worshiping the Lord. On both coasts, John MacArthur, Mark Dever, both of them were tied up for months with legal uh, attacks coming against them from the governors in their own area that tried to put an end to their church services, forcefully. We experience great freedom, but don't take it for granted. Opposition can come by force. There are things happening in Western nations, especially in Europe, that should shock us. But here's the final truth, because I don't want to leave you with nothing but opposition. Opposition will not stop God's plans and purposes. Opposition will not stop God's plans and purposes. Now, I don't want to get too far ahead, because I'm going to spoil the rest of it. But we'll see in a bit. God's providential care. We see a bit, rather, of God's providential care for the returnees, even in the letter of Artaxerxes in verse 21. He says, Therefore make a decree that these men be made to cease, that this city be not rebuilt until a decree is made by me. Artaxerxes <coughs> left it open for him to be able to make a decree for the people to build. It was very difficult for a Persian king to overthrow a decree that he had already made. So in God's providential care, he left it open. And this, by the way, is what allowed Nehemiah and his group to go and rebuild once Artaxerxes actually sends him to do it. So in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, it says, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up, this is Nehemiah speak, I took up wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence, and the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? There is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid, and I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city and the place of my father's graves lies in ruins? Its gates have been destroyed by fire. Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. This is one of those, uh, Lord help me, prayers. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, with the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be gone? When will you return? So it pleased the king to send me. And when I had given him a time, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the king keeper of the king's force, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple, for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. Even in the way that Artaxerxes words his letter, God in his providence allowed for Ezra, I mean for Nehemiah rather, rather to be sent back. Now, the rest of the book of Ezra is a testimony to the fact that the work of God continued. With interruptions, to be sure, but in the end, it was completed. And here's the truth. It was always going to succeed. They may not have understood that, and it may be hard for us to see it in chapter 4, but it was always going to succeed because God was seeing to, seeing to it that it would be done. He told them that it would be completed. And in fact, Nehemiah told us the good hand of God was upon him. And here's the truth for us. The kings of the earth may set themselves against God, against the Lord, and against His church. But Jesus tells us this. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In Matthew 16. You, see, you may say, yeah, but how do we know? Matthew 28. Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. <clears throat> so what does God think about the lost world's rebellion against Him and His Son? Surely He is grieved in some measure by the sins of the lost. But Psalm chapter 2 gives us a bit of a glimpse into the mindset of God when it comes to the rebellion of the kings of the earth. Psalm 2 
Psalm chapter 2 says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. That he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make, make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish in the way, for His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. How does the Lord feel about all of the nations of the earth setting themselves against His Son and against the church? He laughs. <laughs> God is not afraid of mankind. So what do we do? We stay faithful. We do God's work according to His Word, and we trust in the sovereignty of our omnipotent God. I'm not sure where you are today, but if you are a Christian, expect opposition from subterfuge. Expect opposition from the majority. Expect opposition from those who peddle half-truths and misrepresentations. And expect opposition from the forceful hand of those who are in power. But, in the end, trust that all opposition will fail because God is sovereignly ruling and reigning over His creation and there is nothing no one or no thing can do to stop Him. If you are not a Christian here this morning, then I would urge you to heed the words of Psalm 2. Take refuge in the Son. And you know the way. Turn away from your sin and yourself. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. Acknowledge that you are a sinner, rightly condemned before God. And ask Him to save you. That's how you take refuge in the Son. So I don't know where you are this morning. Maybe you're a Christian who is looking around at the state of the nation, the state of the world. And you're fearful. I would say expect opposition. But trust the Lord. Expect it from, to come from the most unlikely, perhaps even unexpected ways. Trust the Lord. Keep your hand on the plow. Continue to move forward. Allow, allow the Lord to dictate the outcome. God's not lost His position of authority. He sits in the heavens. The Lord Jesus Christ is seated at the power of, in the seat of power and authority. And there's nothing, there's no one who can unseat Him. Trust the Lord. If you're not a Christian here today, call out for salvation. Let's go before the Lord. I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. Then we're going to give you a time to respond. Whatever that looks like for you, that's what I want you to do this morning. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you today acknowledging that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness are in a, a warfare. But Father, we know that it is not a war of equals. That you are the sovereign, omnipotent God of all creation. And that no creature can stand in the way of your rule and reign. So, Father, we as your people, we know that when you allow it, opposition comes. But, Father, we must trust. The only option for us is to continue to move forward in obedience. Father, I pray as a church that we would be very careful. That we would be wary of opposition. Knowing that when things are going well, we have a target on our backs. But Father, in the end, we know that your desired outcome will be accomplished. Father, we pray that the lost majority would become the lost minority. That they would hear the gospel and they would respond in repentance and faith. And that the kingdom of God would continue to expand across the globe. Father, we believe that you have the power to save anyone. 
So, Father, we pray for those who don't know you, that today for them would be the day of salvation. Father, we are clay in your hands. Mold us and make us shape our minds according to your scriptures. Father, thank you for loving us, and we love you. And it's in Jesus' name.